If you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 46. Psalm 46, that's the theme of what we've been singing today. And it's going to be the theme of our message. Imagine with me being 19 or 20 years old and riding a boat with a number of your fellow soldiers going to Normandy Beach. In just a few moments, you're going to hit that beach and fight your way up with massive German fire raining down on you. On that day in June, 4,414 Allied troops were killed, 2,500 and one of them being American soldiers. Over our short history as a nation, many have given their lives for our freedoms. Um, there is such a thing as just war. There is a thing as unjust war. Um, but there is such a thing as just war. Our rights are given to us by God, not by our government. Our rights are given to us by God and not our government. It is not the job of government to give us those rights. They can't do that. But it has always been the job of human government to preserve those rights. When a country sends its men to war to preserve the rights of life and liberty, then all of those men give something. Some of those men give everything. And it's because of those kinds of sacrifices, because men went where their country called them to go and spilled their blood and gave their lives so that we can be here today worshiping. Aren't you glad we can come together and worship? I'm so thankful for that. And the right to enjoy the barbecue tomorrow and the worship today comes at a price. And I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful for the men and women who gave their lives and ones who didn't necessarily die, but also fought and served so that we can, so that we can enjoy this. So I think we ought to be thankful for those men. And I think it's going to be an awesome day tomorrow to barbecue. Who's for meat? Anybody here for meat? I'm for meat. I am pro-meat. It's the only thing I'm allowed to smoke. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> but that's not the point of tomorrow. We got to remember those who gave their lives. And so today we find ourselves in Psalm 46. And I chose Psalm 46 because I think it goes well with this theme of, of people giving their lives and God giving um, his protection. The Psalm 46, we find written in three stanzas, first one through three. You guys have your Bibles? Bibles are good, aren't they? Look, look at Psalm 46. Look at the end of verse three. What's the last word in verse three? What is it? Selah. Okay. Now go down to verse seven. Let's read verse seven all, all together. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Verse 11, read it together with me. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Now, some have suggested that when the psalm was sung, the psalm was sung, that the refrain that happens in verse 7 and verse 11 was also repeat, repeated at the end of verse 3. It's not contained in our text but it's certainly part of the theme of the verse. It's repeated twice. Maybe when it was sung, it was repeated three times. And whenever you come to a, a refrain, a chorus, a um, verse in, within a passage that's repeated, uh, it gives you a clue as to what's the point of this psalm. And, and um, here, here's the point. Are you ready? Um, your money is not your refuge. Um, your guns, I'm pro-gun. You probably ought to have one. Hope you don't get mad at me. 
but that's not your refuge. Your investments aren't your refuge. Your relationships with your friendships, your network of people, that is not your refuge. Who is our refuge? The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I have chosen this psalm today because of its relevance for this Memorial Sunday. During the First World War in an island community in the highlands of Scotland, young men were being called up in increasing numbers for military service. Each time, contingents of them gathered at the pier to sail to the mainland. Their relatives and friends assembled, and there they sang this song from the English, or sorry, from the Scottish Psalter that... um, based on Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength in straits of present, in straits of pre, a present aid. Therefore, all the earth removed, we will not be afraid. Though hills amidst the sea be cast, though waters roaring make, and troubled be, yea, through the hills by swelling seas do, do shake, a river whose streams make glad the city of our God, the holy place wherein the Lord might most high made his abode. God, in the midst of her doth dwell, nothing shall her remove. The Lord of her a helper will, and that right early prove. Be still and know that I am God among the heathen I. Will be exalted, I on earth will be exalted high. Our God, who is the Lord of hosts, is still upon our side. The God of Jacob, our refuge, forever will abide. Isn't that beautiful? The scene This scene is one of thousands in which God's saints have been comforted by this psalm in times of great crisis. No one can know the hearts that have been lifted up as the majestic lines of Psalm 46 have been read in the hospital room, in the house of mourning, and in the prison of persecution. It was this psalm that led a former Augustinian monk named Martin Luther to pen his famous Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is our God. He, he, he was repeating this Psalm 46. Its message is timeless and its encouragements unceasing. When it was written, this Psalm 46, now I'm not referring to Martin Luther, I'm referring to this Psalm. It was likely written to be sung by people facing the chaos of battle. For those of us who listen today, it most likely applies in the uh, chaos of the known and the unknown of life. The, the, the truth of, this, of our situation is this. We have had, who, who agrees with me? We've had a pretty tumultuous past couple of years in our country. And it doesn't seem like it's going to be ending. There was a pandemic with unsatisfactory answers. There's economic uncertainty. There's political uncertainty. And and being a pastor, I don't just see this kind of difficulty on a national scale. I see it in the lives of the families and marriages. We we see people going through personal crisis and difficulty. We see, um, you know, usually bad diagnosis aren't on the calendar ahead of time. (laughs) You don't don't know when they're going to happen. Life can be difficult and chaotic Who do we trust in when things are difficult? Who do we put our confidence in when we face chaos? We should put our confidence in God. And we should do it because of who he is for his people. I want to give you who God is for us that know him as Savior. Number one, God is our refuge and strength. God is our refuge in chaos. Read verse one with me. You want to read it out loud with me? Just this first time, read this with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. We begin this week in Psalm 46, a beautiful song written by warrior poets. The psalm is attributed to the sons of Korah, which is more like a dedication Um, These are probably not the authors, but who it was received by. The theme is given immediately. The capacity that these people had, especially in battle and certainly in life, was really nothing in comparison to the Lord. The Lord is our refuge and strength. (laughs) 
The safety, the strength and hope that they had was not ultimately in military might. Their strength and their refuge was in the Lord. And that's why in verse two, he gives us a therefore. Because he is our refuge and strength and who, who's thankful that he's a present help. He's with us. That's what we just sang. That's what the choir just sang, isn't it? He's with us in the fire. He's a shelter with us in the storm. He says, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. That sounds violent, doesn't it? When it says, therefore, think, because this is true, because God is our refuge, our strength, the present help in times of trouble. When you read, therefore, think on this basis, because this is true, what are the implications? We will not fear. Who likes that? We won't fear. Like, Pastor Ben, I fear. I get it. (laughs) Me too. Sometimes just coming up here and talking to you guys is scary right? Um, For a lot of reasons. Um, But when you realize that God is your refuge and strength, and he's very present help in time of trouble, you certainly don't have to fear. And if you're fearing, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe he isn't that to you. Because God is our refuge, because God is our strength, and he's a very present help in trouble, we won't have to fear. This is an obvious expression of both faith in God and also experience with God. They're counseling themselves into putting their trust in where it should be, God. Now, in the English, you see the word though four times. Let's read it again. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. When I first read that passage when I was studying, I thought of those as four different things. But I think actually if you read it, you you read it connected. It's like a picture. It's like imagine, it's not four events, it's one. Imagine you have your house on a mountain. You're living on a mountain and all of a sudden the mountain starts getting lifted up out of like in the air. You guys with me? Like sci-fi Marvel movie style, right? Like it's coming up. What, what do you do if you're living on a house and the mountain starts levitating? Who's it, who is worried, right? And then that every person and animal in the house and the building on it are picked up and then they're dropped in the middle of the ocean. What happens when there are earthquakes in the ocean? Tidal waves. Are you with me? And that's what it says? The Bible makes sense if you read it, right? Right? The earth is removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof, there's the word thereof. That's what tells me it's not four different things, it's one thing. The drops in the sea, and then there's like all this, who agrees that's chaotic? Who, who thinks they might lose a sheep or a car or a, none of you have sheep, a dog, right? You're probably going to lose something in that. Is there going to be house damage? Who's calling insurance on Monday, right? You can't. You don't have a car. You, there's no self-service. There's, who agrees with me? That's pretty chaotic. And so it's dropped in the middle of the sea. And he says, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, that means the the tidal wave goes back and hits the mountains that were left over. It's cataclysmic, chaotic. And when the writer started writing, he knew he was getting to that illustration. And he wrote before, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. To which we might ask, yeah, when I get a hangnail, yeah, when, uh, when they don't have any Coke Zero, all they have is Coke. That's a crisis for me, okay? And, and, no, 
God's our refuge and strength in the huge, big, gigantic. Of course, God's in, our, in those little things, but God's also in the big things. Even if, you're, if your mountain gets tossed into the sea and you lose everything, God is a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. This kind of epic destruction of would, of course, be the kind of cataclysmic event sufficient to, prove, to produce all kinds of fear. Yet this kind of highly impactful, incredible circumstance could be endured by the psalmist who says that God is our refuge and I don't have to be afraid, even if all that happens. So how do we apply that? God's our refuge in the chaos. It doesn't happen all the time, but there have certainly been seasons in my life that felt catac- like personally cataclysmic as, the, as these ones described. You ever feel like your mountains are getting tossed into the sea? Relationship problems, financial problems, political and social issues all threaten and cause fear. They can certainly feel like someone is tossing mountains where we establish our lives and put our trust. We lose our job. Our kids get sick. Someone's lying about us and harming our reputation, and it feels like no small thing. The what-ifs plague our mind and do havoc to our stomachs. What do we need to remember in those tossed mountain moments? We don't have to be afraid. The God of Jacob is our refuge. A few, about a year ago, I got a call from a good friend of mine who called me to tell me that she got a diagnosis that she's going to die and it would be very soon. She's called me to do her funeral. And I hated that. I hated that so much. She's, I think they told her three months, six months, something like that. And a year later, she's still here. And, and, and like three months ago, she called me and said, well, they're calling my family in. Ben, would you come see me? And I went and saw her. I thought maybe that might be the last time I'd see her. Mountain tossed, right? And uh, I got another call from her. She said, hey, can we come to your church on Memorial Day? And I said, yeah, you can. So she's here. Isn't that awesome? It's Rita right there. I told her when that happened that sometimes when God allows people to get that kind of diagnosis, that God then gives them a platform in that diagnosis to speak for him. And that's what's been going on in her life. And there's people that are coming to Christ and being affected by her because she's going through this difficulty. And what I think is amazing is to live as Christ and to die as gain, right? And God is our refuge, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we shall not fear. How how is he a present help? You can pray to him. You can pray to him. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. You can trust him. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. If you know Christ as your Savior, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Even when your mountain is tossed, You can survive in Christ. Even if your life is taken, eternity with the Lord will be better than anything that you can ask or think. God is our refuge in the chaos. Number two, this is amazing. God is our calm in calamity. God is our calm in difficulty. In in verses two and three, the psalm, we're, we're pointed to God as a refuge. The psalmist confidently sings of the safety and help and strength and protection of God in the midst of the chaos. And and when he talks about that chaos, there's the roaring and troublings of water in the sea. Even when there is that kind of calamity chaos, we can put our faith and trust to choose that God is over our fear. But look at the contrast there. First, you have the foaming of the sea. Then you see in verse four, there's a river. Do you see that in verse four? 
There's a river, the streams whereof shall make the city, make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, of the city. She shall not be moved. Can I say that again? She shall not be moved. She shall not be moved. The mountains sometimes get moved. This one won't. God shall help her and that right early. Instead of the foaming, roaring, troubled ocean, we have a river that has a subsequent streams. And in, instead of finding ourselves in the midst of the sea, we're in the midst of the city of God, coming to the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Instead of tempting the people of God to be afraid like the ocean, what is the, this river doing? It's making glad the city of God. Many scholars seem to point to the city of Jerusalem as this city of God in question. This would be sung by the whole community of Israel as a statement of confidence in Jehovah God, especially with the potential of invading nations, as we're going to see. Verse 5 tells us that God is in the midst, or in the morning up in the midst of the sea. Why? God shall help her, and that right early. God is never late. Instead of chaos here, we have calm. Who's for calm? I like calm. I got three kids and a dog. I like calm. I got a wife gone, and it's been crazy. Like, Bingo's eating stuff that's not food. I went to trim my beard, and it was too short. My thing was set wrong, and so now I have this tension between looking young and looking thin, and I need the beard to be back to hide my face. Um, I like calm. Instead of chaos, we have calm. The psalm is not declaring that chaos doesn't happen. It's claiming that the people of God can have a calm and assurance in the promise-keeping and protecting presence of our God. Look at verse 6. So you have like the calm of the, the streams and the, the people of God being glad where God's in the midst of her. And you had the foaming seas that were made foaming and roaring and tumultuous because of the mountain that's tossed in. Now you see in verse 6 a different, different kind of foaming and raging. Verse 6, the heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth, what does it say? Melted. They're, they're, the people of Israel's worry was all their enemies. Um, at this second stanza of the psalm, we're introduced to another kind of chaos and difficulty. Raging and moving heathens are coming for the people of God. Political and military might is foaming like the waters that roar, like the mountains that are moving back in verse 2 and 3. To have a whole raging kingdom set themselves against you, against your people and your city, would certainly be cause for concern. Do we ever get concerned about stuff like that? You ever talk, see the commentators, the talking heads on TV, pontificate about the potential dangers of nations across the world? We, we have had probably a little bit of anxiety. The people of Jerusalem in that walled city of God, they just looked over there. Sometimes they would look over their wall and there's all the nations. They're ready to take them out. Who would be like worried if Toledo was coming to take over Finley? Right? We, weren't, we wouldn't be worried about Bluffton. I don't know, maybe we would be. You get my point. Like the enemy's right there. And that's what they're dealing with. And that's why they say, we will not fear. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Specifically, verse six, the solution to the raging heathen is clear. He uttered his voice. Who's he? God. And what happened to the heathen? They melted. The word for melted is a very descriptive word. It could mean melt like soften. The heathen are the mountains threatening to topple us, and God melts them. God softens them. Sometimes he did it by conquering, right? Sometimes God did that by conquering. Sometimes God did it by them, their conversion. Anybody ever heard of a hero of Jonah? You know what Nineveh was? The capital city of the Assyrians. You know who hated Jews? Assyrians. 
And Jonah didn't want to go preach to the Assyrians. Why? Because he hated them. Because they were the ones that killed all of his family and friends. And how did God take care of them? The whole city got saved. They converted in, in the sense of converting to God. God melted them. God softened them. So that at the end of verse 6, God gives two names, the Lord of hosts. You know what hosts are? Hosts are armies. When it says the Lord of hosts, it's the Lord of armies. The, sometimes it refers to angel armies. There were times in the Old Testament where God would open the eyes of the people and there were angel armies protecting the people of God. I believe that still happens. The Lord of hosts, he says, is with us, the God of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means the word Israel means wrestles with God. This was the name of their nation. And the patriarch Jacob certainly wrestled with God. And in that way, God had wrestled with and conquered Israel. They had submitted to him. And now he is with them. He is their refuge. The God who makes the mountains melt is on their side. You know, when, when Jesus comes back at the end and he makes war to conquer and to come back and, and rule and reign in Jerusalem, um, he won't really have to fight. We'll be with him in one word, and he conquers everything. You want to be on his side. You want to be on his side. How do we apply this? God is our calm in the difficulty. The fear of man is certainly a snare and a trap. We can spend a lot of time and energy worrying about what decision we should make based on the reaction of other people. Sometimes the question we ask is, what will this person think? Rather than, what's the right thing to do? Anybody here ever deal with that? You're thinking about, I should make this decision based on what they're thinking, when really we should be making the decision on, what does God want? What's the right thing to do? Or similarly, importantly, what does God want? My security is found in the truth that when I do what God wants, I'm leaning into the truth by faith that he is my refuge. He is with me. What can the difficulty brought about by others ultimately do to me? He makes the mountains melt with his word. We can trust God. Jesus didn't promise that we would not endure tribulation. He did promise that he would never leave us nor forsake us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We can have calm in the midst of our difficulty. We can have peace. You know what peace is? Peace is a quiet assurance that what God is doing is best. That's what it is. Who wants peace? That's what I want. He is that for those who trust him. God is our calm in the difficulty. God is our refuge in chaos and God is our protection in the violence. Look at verse eight. I love what the psalmist does here. He is, that's my fault, sorry. He is, uh, they're singing this psalm and they're singing the psalm and saying, God's our refuge, our strength. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob's our refuge. Yeah, we've got enemies coming at us. The heathen rage, the, the soldiers are coming, but I'm telling you what's going to happen. You want to know what happens with my enemies when they come at me? Ready? Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. You know what he's saying? We're going to win. We're going to win. You're not applying it to yourself. Like, we're going to win. Right? Right? We're going to win. We're going to win. <laughs> he maketh wars to say, who's for making war stop? You know how war stop? Victory. Desolation. <laughs> He's going to come and end all wars. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He makes the wars to cease. <laughs> Unto the end of the earth, he breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. Have you seen their missiles? Have you seen their bullets? Nuclear, eh, drones, eh, eh. God, we win, right? Now, I'm not saying 
that our government's always right. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if we're on the Lord's side, we're on the right side. That's what I'm saying. For sure on the list of things giving fear to the people of Jerusalem were these nations. The, for the city to look over its walls and see a massive bowmen and spearmen and the devastating technology of the horse-drawn chariot could have made them quake. But of course, this is why they're singing the song. Sure, they had their own armies and their own technology, but this was not their confidence. Their confidence was in God, in the God that makes desolations of his enemies, that breaks the bow and cuts the spear and burns out those chariots. He is their might. He is their refuge. He is their very present help in time of trouble. So can you imagine them singing this song and there's armies on the other side with all this stuff. And then they say, so here's our strategy. Since the God of Jacob is our help, the God of our Jacob is our refuge. Here's what we're going to do. Verse 10, be still. What? It's battle time. The last thing you do is be still at battle time. That's like my girls every time I want to go somewhere by an appointed time. We have to leave the house. It's time to go. I'm coming. You know what I'm coming means? Nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It is a lie. They are not coming. And all the dads said, amen. Amen. The last thing you do in battle is be still. But he says, be still and know that I am God. You know what he's saying? Don't trust in your silly swords and your silly chariots and your silly, uh, what else, spears, your guns. Your, don't, trust in that. don't trust in your 401k. Don't trust in your wealth. Don't trust in your might. Don't trust in all of that stuff. That is not your refuge. The Lord is our refuge. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Read verse 11 with me. The Lord of hosts is our, with us. The God of Jacob. In this psalm, we've heard of mountains being tossed in the sea. We've heard of tidal waves. We've heard of heathen raging and kingdoms warring. We've heard of bowmen and spearmen and chariots, the worst of military technology, leveled against us. The psalm culminates in the final two verses that ask you to do something very specific. Be still and know that I'm God. He is God, the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent creator and Lord of the universe. The end of all that Israel was facing is God's exaltation. He will be exalted among the enemies of Israel. The whole earth will know that he is God. Then the repeated refrain displays their confidence in God one more time. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So what is the application for us? Like most Americans, I have lived in a nation secure enough for me to not have to deal with substantial threats of physical harm from conquering nations. Yet that does not mean that we're immune from that kind of threat. We are threatened by the chance for physical violence whenever we step out our door. Did you know that there are like three missionaries killed this week in Haiti? Was God like taking a break and missed out on something? Does, does, God, know what he, does God know what he's doing? There are certainly people opposed to what we are and who as those who are named in Christ. 
and what we stand for in this world. Jesus told us that we would be subject to persecution just like he was. There are other kinds of threats of violence as well. People may ask, seek to harm our reputations through false accusation. They may seek to threaten us through massive political, economic, social change. If you haven't paused and gazed with concern over those walls at those coming armies, you're not paying attention. Yet we serve a God who makes desolations of his enemies. We also serve a God who loves his enemies. And can you, I want you to know he's going to melt them either way. His word will melt their hearts and they'll become his kids. That's the story for all of us who got saved. We went from enemies to his kids if we know Christ. But there's not going to be any sin that's let go. We serve a God who makes desolation of evil armies. He is a war-ending God. Military might, political influence, social capital, what are these against our God? So the question is this, am I on his side? Am I trusting him? Is my confidence in my plans, in my finances, in my intellect, in my job, in my spear, in my bow, in my chariot, or is my confidence in seeking refuge in the Lord of hosts? How do I know? Have you been obedient to what he says? You know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And there comes a point in our lives, in the middle of the crisis, in the middle of the tossed mountains, while the other enemies are over our gates chanting, with their spears and their torches and their chariots where no more can be done to get you out of that situation. There's nothing more to put on the task list. There's not not another phone call you can make to get you through it. There, There are some things that man cannot fix. There's a time to be still. No more working, no more trying, no more sweat, Only God can do what needs to be done. I'm not advocating that you shouldn't do the right thing at all times. I'm not advocating laziness. I'm not saying that there are some things that we should stop doing. When we pray and ask God to intervene, we must believe that he will do it. A few weeks ago, as I was writing this message, that's exactly what happened to me. A friend had a difficulty. They called me. They said, this is what's going on. And you know what I could tell them about what was going on? What should I do, Pastor Ben? I don't know. I don't know. You're like, you didn't tell him to pray? We've been praying. You didn't give him a Bible verse? He's had a lot of Bible verses. He's doing everything he can do. What he needed to do was Trust. Trust. Be still and know that I am God. Did it work out? It's working out. It's working out. It ain't done yet. Who knows? He knows. What do we do in that time? We trust God. And we believe that to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, if you're disobeying, stop. If there is a Bible verse that tells you what to do, do it. Obey. If you can think of some things to do on the task list, trust me, if you think I don't like task lists, come over. I'll show you. To-do lists are a good thing. And if I tell you, if I ask you to do something that you say you'll do and you won't write it down, I'm scared. Okay? So I'm not against it. But there's some things that need to happen that man can't do. Be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted 
in the earth. We got to trust. There is chaos all of us face. There is difficulty every man, woman, boy, and girl must deal with. There is violence that is potential for every person. And we are sinners. We are sinners by nature. And if you don't agree with that, don't be alarmed. You're also a sinner by choice. We, we sin through acts of commission and omission. We do things that violate God's law. We don't do things to keep God's law. Sin is sin because it violates the person and character of God. Love is good because it's who God is. And when I don't love, I'm sinning against God and others. We all fall in many ways. And God is a holy God. And he can't let sin go. And my sin made me an enemy of God. But God is also loving and gracious and merciful. He knows that when we face judgment for our sins, we can't stand. There's a, a, a psalm we're going to um, study in a couple weeks that says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? If you were to count people's faults, who could stand? None of us could. To face God's just wrath for sin would mean eternal separation from God. But God is our refuge in that chaos. He is our calm in that difficulty, and he can be our protection against even that kind of violence. How? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. Don't let this be old to you. Like, oh, he's getting into the gospel. Here's the obligatory gospel presentation at the end of the sermon. Correct. But get this. God sent his son, Jesus, to this earth Being God, he had no sin nature, and being man, he became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. On that cross, he suffered, bled, and died for your sin and mine. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. And when you trust in Jesus, God gives you Jesus' righteousness. He saves you. He becomes for you in that moment your refuge and your present help in time of trouble. When we we ask if you're saved today, that's what I'm asking. Have you placed your trust in Christ alone? We're not saved by works. What do you need to do? Believe. Trust. Be still and know that I am God. You can trust Jesus. He is our refuge in the chaos. He is our calm in the difficulty. He is our protection in the violence. Listen to this. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not as equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, that man of God's own choosing. Does ask, who may that be? Christ Jesus. It is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his triumph through us, his truth to triumph through us. The the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure (laughs) for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through whom, through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Be still and know that I am God. 
Here's my question. Is he your God today? Have you placed your faith and trust in Christ alone? Will you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed.